words of power because we are kings and our words matter. God loves us beyond anything else. God's love is love that never forsakes. God will never forsake you. Anybody and everybody will forsake you in this world. But there is a God who will never forsake. Put your trust in him and you will never be put to shame. And Lord, I offer my life to you. Everything I been through. Use it for your glory. Lord, I offer my days to you. Lifting my praise to you as a pleasing sacrifice. Lord, I offer you my When the blessing was pronounced, what is it saying? It's saying, may God make his face shine upon you. That means may you be blessed. Live with his face shining upon you all the time. Live with his countenance coming upon you all the time. Be blessed. Be, be recipient of God's grace, his gracious gifts. It will make you a winner. It will make you an overcomer. It will give you power over your enemies. It will give you power over your circumstances. When God, you have God's grace, you become a winner. So this blessing was a very big thing. By contrast, the cursing was the absence of God. God turning his face away. And uh, to be cursed means to God, to, 
to, God, to have God turn his face away from you. The Bible says when Jesus was on the cross, God who cannot even look upon sin, because he cannot look upon sin and Jesus became sin, carrying our sin and became cursed. God had to turn his face away from him. Therefore, Jesus experienced that cursedness. Cursedness is nothing but God turning his face away from that man, from any man. Cursedness is where a man does not have God's presence, is not granted to look at God's face, no shining glory coming towards him, no light of God's countenance. Literally, that is what is called outer darkness. That's what is outer darkness. This was exactly carried out in the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, two lambs were brought, two animals were brought. One was killed, its blood was shed. Both of them signified what Jesus did through his redemptive work. But two animals were needed to show what one Jesus would do. One was killed, blood was shed, the blood was taken and sprinkled on mercy seat. Why? Because the blood is the proof that sin has been punished. God is a God of justice. Sin has to be punished. He cannot let the sinner go free. So God wants proof that justice has been done. Sin has been punished. So the animal was killed, blood was shed, sprinkled. But there was another animal live there called scapegoat. The priest would lay, the high priest would lay his hands upon the scapegoat and confess the sin upon the of the entire nation upon it, symbolically. They believed that all the sin was transferred by that means to that animal. After he got through confessing, they won't kill that animal there because that's a sacred place, a place of meeting with God for the people. And here is this animal carrying the sin so they will drive that animal out, that scapegoat out, and drive it outside the city where there was no one, where place where no one lives. You read about in Leviticus 16, verse 20 to 22, talks about how they will drive it far away and people look at it as the goat goes. And they say, there it goes, goes, and there is, they see very little of it. And, and then finally, it disappears from their sight. Somebody takes it and leaves it in a place so far away that the goat will never find its way back. It'll die there in that wilderness, scorched in the sun, the heat, and without food, it'll die there, going there, bearing the sins of the nation, taking it away. In the Bible, in the English Bibles, you will find two words. One is propitiation. Propitiation means that Jesus took our sins upon himself carried it upon himself. That is what propitiation is. But Jesus not only carried it upon himself and took the punishment upon himself and propitiated for our sins, he also did another thing, and the English Bible uses the word expiation. Expiation means that he carried it away, put it away, as far as east is from the west, never to return to us. And in Jesus' life, this thing was fulfilled with great accuracy. This thing about the scapegoat was fulfilled and the, and the other, other animal also. This whole scene of atonement was fulfilled in amazing detail. I'll show you how, especially the scapegoat. The scapegoat was driven out, out of, out of the Jewish territory, out of, away from, into the Gentile world, you know. Jesus was handed over to the Gentiles to be crucified, not by the Jews, because Gentiles were known as the strangers of the covenant outside the camp. And Jesus was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem in Golgotha, not in the city of Jerusalem, outside the walls of Jerusalem. And he was not executed by stoning, which was Jewish method. He was executed by crucifixion, which is a Roman method. It's all Gentile methods because he's been rejected, cast out. He's a castaway, like the goat was put out and taken into a no man's territory, 
Jesus was cast out because he bore our sins. That's the thing, significance there. But finally, the fullest manifestation of the curse is found when he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was not just a cry where he thought he was forsaken. No, it actually, he was forsaken. It actually carried the curse upon himself. The father actually turned his back upon his son. Father had to turn his way, uh, face away and not let Jesus see his countenance because that is what a sinner would get for his sin. And Jesus had to experience that in order to make redemption possible. You know, the Apostles' Creed, which people recite in churches, goes something like this. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead and buried, descended into hell. You have noticed that? Now, some churches strike out the descended into hell because they think it was inserted later and so on. It's not in the original and all that business, you know. Because some people don't want to believe that he descended into hell. I'm ready to believe that because I think there's every reason to believe that. But that's another story. But even those who don't believe that he descended into hell do believe that on the cross itself, Jesus experienced hell actually may not have descended into hell. They say, on the cross when he was hanging, he, he experienced hell. Why? Because that is what a sinner must experience. That is what is the portion of the sinner. And Jesus being a perfect substitute who carried our sin and our curse and the punishment for our sin, therefore must experience hell. And he experienced it in, on the cross, they say. New York City, a preacher was preaching in a very bad area where prostitutes walk up and down trying to look for their customers. This guy was having a megaphone in his hand preaching, repent or go to hell, you know. And the, and the lady that was walking up and down, one of them stopped and said, preacher, I'm already in hell. <laughs> See, she has not been to hell. She's in New York City. But she says, I'm already in hell. In what way was she in hell? She was in hell because God's grace was not upon her. She didn't have God's favor. She didn't have God's face shining upon her. There is no light in her life. It was all darkness. There was no blessing in her life. There was cursedness, unhappiness, misery. She said, preacher, I'm in hell. That's hell. Hell is where there is no God. And you can never see the face of God and never experience the presence of God. So they say in that way, Jesus experienced hell on the cross of Calvary as he hung there. There he was in hell, literally, descended into hell in experience. On the cross of Calvary, descended into hell. But again, the question remains, how can a God who let him experience all this be a good God if he had allowed his own son, only son, to experience this? What guarantee do we have that he won't forsake us? But to answer this, you have to go back to the original covenant, the covenant before eternity past. In eternity past, the covenant of redemption. What was the covenant about? Three of them agreed. Love prepared a plan of salvation. God, the Father, in his love, saw that man would sin and prepared a savior for him. And Jesus, the Son, He's also love. He's also full of love. And He, out of love, agreed to go down, consider His equality of God as nothing, and go down and become a man and live in flesh among us and be born in this world, live among us, and to die on the cross and be treated in that way, to be humiliated even to the death on the cross and even to the point of suffering literal hell on the cross. It was agreed upon. So what was happening on the cross when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's not like he came here trusting God will, will, will take care of him and trusting God will keep him from death and all that, keep him from destruction. And that he came here, and but God failed him. No, it's not like that. It's not what you think. He came to die. He came to bear our sins. He's a sin bearer. He came for that purpose. 
There was an understanding in the covenant between the father and the son. He came for that purpose. How many of you see what I'm talking about? He didn't come here thinking that father will save him and the father failed to save him and forsake him. Forsake him. No, no, no. It was an agreement. There was something happening by plan, by design. But let me go to Isaiah 53 for just a moment. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgression. See, substitutionary. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. It was all for us. He didn't sin. He didn't do anything wrong. He was sinless because of our sins, because of our transgressions. Wounded because of us, suffered because of us, died because of us. But then verse 10 is the most difficult to understand for everybody. Look at verse 10, particularly in English, because English has it this way. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. This is very difficult for people to swallow. They say, my God, look at this father. It pleased him to bruise him. That means as he suffered, he derived some kind of sadistic pleasure out of the suffering of his son. It looks like that, the way, the way it is said. But it's not like what you're, what you're thinking. People interpret it like that. They say, it pleased God to bruise him. That means God was pleased with the bruising of Jesus, with the beating, with the nailing, with, the, with all the suffering. And did, was God pleased? Certainly not, my friend. God is not some crazy person. God is a God of love. Then why does it say it pleased God to bruise him? What was God pleased with? I tell you, God was not having some sadistic delight and pleasure in his son's death and in his son's suffering. And what pleased him? He was pleased because redemption was accomplished for mankind. See, you must read the Bible with some sense, you know. You shouldn't read with a Crooked mind, you know, saying, oh, look at this, God, you know, I don't want a God like that. Well, just open your eyes, my friend, read the Bible reasonably. God was not pleased with his son's suffering. God was pleased with the redemption that has now been carried out for mankind. It pleased the, God, it pleased God, the Father that the Son was willing to give his life as ransom for the people. Please the Father that the Son was willing to make himself of no reputation so we people can be redeemed. Please the Father that the Son did not change the eternal plan of salvation and went ahead with it even though he agonized, it, agonized over it. He went ahead with it willingly because he's so full of love just as the Father. He went ahead with it and carried on with it and did it to completion. He was pleased. Not in the pain that he endured. He was play, pleased in the redemption that he provided. Finally, let me just say this and it'll seal everything. The father was always in favor of the son and the son was always in favor of the father. You can see it in so many ways. One, you can see it in the last words of Jesus. What was the last words of Jesus? He looks at the Father and he says, it is finished. It's like a report card he was sending to the Father. <laughs> now if, G if Father sent him to down to earth, and then he's crying here and Father forsook him, then he won't be saying it's finished. He'll be saying, you're finished. What did you do to me? How can you leave me like this? How can you forsake me like this? What have you done? That's the kind of cry I would be crying if I felt that the Father has betrayed me and forsaken me and left me and has no love and has done some injustice for me. But he looks at the Father because he has an understanding with the Father from eternity past. He looks at the Father and says, it is finished. In other words, he's saying, Lord, you sent me for this purpose to die. You gave me a body. I was born of a virgin, came in this world, lived here, and I carried out what you planned and committed to me successfully. Finished. And after he said it's finished, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
You think he didn't trust the father? He didn't love the father? You think father did something wrong to him? You think the father forsook him? No, it was not the kind of forsaking that people talk about out there. They don't understand a thing about this. The different kind of forsakenness. There was an agreement between the two from eternity past. He simply came in here and carried it out. And God was pleased with it. He was, son was pleased with it. Difficult, but yet he did it. So he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That is one thing. The last statement is that witness to the fact that Father and him were together as usual. Nothing against one another. Father didn't betray him. The father didn't leave him completely. Secondly, because the Jewish Sabbath was coming, they wanted to make sure everybody was dead because they didn't want to deal with it during Sabbath. They don't want dead bodies. So they said, kill. If they're not dead, break their legs and kill them. So they went about killing. The, the, the thieves were alive. And so they broke their legs and stuff and made them suffer more and, and they were killed before Sabbath began. They came to Jesus do, trying to do the same thing and they found that he's already dead. Because he died not by them killing him, he died by giving his spirit to the Father. He committed his spirit to the Father. He was finished. They looked at him and they didn't break any bones and it was already prophesied in the Old Testament that nobody will break his bones. He died there. See, God made sure. See, God is a just God. After the work was over, after he said it's finished, he made sure not even one bone was broken. After he said it's finished, he made sure that no one touched him made, made sure, and, and, and made sure that nothing happened to him. And then, The body of these criminals usually hung on the cross, usually are thrown into a place called Gehenna. Gehenna is a word used for hell in the Bible. But there was a place outside of Jerusalem called Gehenna, which is only a garbage dump. And these criminals' bodies are thrown there. They won't give them a decent burial. They'll throw them there so that it burns with their garbage. That's the way they're treated. But when Jesus died, a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea went and got the body of Jesus and buried him in a rich tomb. Some people like to present Jesus as poor always. In birth poor, in life poor, in death poor, everything poor. They have some pleasure, sadistic pleasure in saying that Jesus is poor. <laughs> but Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God gave him. God gave him a glorious, wonderful burial, amazing burial. A man went and got his body, and he was buried decently because God is one who never forsakes, never leaves. He still cared about his son. Once he finished the job, now things are different, you see. It was agreed upon. Then final seal that God is a God of love is that he raised him again from the dead. Resurrection, not only raised him, but raised him far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that's named, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Gave him such glory and honor and lifted him and raised him above everything. That is our God. Jesus is seated there with God now. To say that God forsook Jesus, therefore he's a bad God, I tell you, is a poor judgment on the part of some people. They don't understand a thing. The truth is, God in his love and Jesus, the Son in his love, carried out some things that are very difficult with understanding and carried it out successfully because they love us. God loves us beyond anything else. God's love is love that never forsakes. God will never forsake you. Anybody and everybody will forsake you in this world, but there is a God who will never forsake. Put your trust in him and you will never be put to shame. Let's clap our hands. When you sing this, sing it like a prayer, all right? Really meaning it. As I wait, as I wait, you make me strong.
Fill this place and to make your presence known in our presence.